Please turn with me in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. We'll be beginning uh, this week, we'll be beginning a series of uh, three sermons out of Proverbs chapter 3 over the, the next three weeks as Pastor Sean prepares with the Peru team to leave with them. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to open up God's word. And I pray that as we read it, as we interact with it, that we would heed Jesus' warning that we should not live for bread alone, nor the food that perishes, but we should draw life from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, including this passage. The reading from Proverbs chapter 3 from the English Standard Version. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord and do good. All right, actually, I was quoting the wrong passage. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Our God and Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word feeds us. Father, your word convicts us. Your word gives us life. Father, I pray, Lord, give life to each heart in this room by faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, send your spirit to do these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, would you describe yourself as a confident person? Would you describe yourself as a confident person? Uh, as a parent, you know, we look at our children and we see um, there's a, an influence in, in the a child's disposition. Certain children seem to just come out of the womb and they're ready to rule the world. They are confident and they just never look back. Others are careful, hesitant, um, more measured in, their, in what they do. And it's interesting if you look at the word confidence and you think of, uh, think of it as it's evolved over time. The contemporary definition of confidence really includes this sense of self-confidence, to believe in oneself. And we see this played out in many ways. We have these catchphrases and these mantras that are popular, uh, one of which is fake it till you make it. Right? Fake it till you make it. But what does that mean? I, it means I don't believe I belong in this position, but I'm just going to keep trying and hopefully something will turn out good. Like, fake it till you make it. So that's a way of de seemingly developing self-confidence, although I question whether it actually will lead to something that is credible, that you can build upon. Um, and we think, you know, by adopting these slogans, like we're going to somehow just magically become more confident in ourselves. We'll just magically uh, create uh, the ability to do what we need to do that's before us. But the, the universal problem in these sorts of strategies is really the problem that is true in all of human nature. And if you look inside your heart, as much as you try to fill it with good stuff, you will find that that container has a leak. Your, your love tank has a hole. And as much as you try to put stuff into it, it just drains out. And really, this was forecasted hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth, as the prophet Jeremiah received the diagnosis from the Lord God. And Jeremiah says this of the people of God. He says, my people, 
My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So the Lord himself, who is the source of confidence, the source of all good, they have forsaken him. But then secondly, they have hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, containers that can hold no water. The hole can't be filled with your own strength, with your own initiative, with your own insight, your own abilities. You see, if you define a problem incorrectly, you'll never get the solution that you truly need. And so defining the problem is absolutely necessary. If I think self-assurance or adopting mantras like believe in yourself are going to make a difference in my life, I'm going to be sadly mistaken. I need to find a true source of confidence, a true source of hope to build upon. Confidence is to put one's trust in something. And the basis for that trust is the Lord himself. In fact, at the end of Proverbs, we read this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And when it speaks of fear, it means in the sense of holding someone in esteem, holding them above uh, and higher than oneself. To, but to fear a man, to hold him in esteem higher than the Lord himself is to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord finds safety, security. That's the thing we ultimately need. Today we begin this series of three sermons in Proverbs chapter 3, and we're continuing the theme that we've seen as we've begun Proverbs uh, several months ago, the theme of godly wisdom lived in relationship. Godly wisdom lived in relationship. So we see in this chapter, we see actually in the whole of scripture, the basis for confidence should never be found in my own reasoning and my own understanding but it's found in covenant with the living God, according to his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And that such confidence will then result in living a life of blessing. Or what Pastor Sean has been preaching, uh, it, the result would be trusting the Lord brings about a fruitful life, a fruitful life that comes from walking in the spirit, not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So God's commands are covenantal stipulations. They are requirements. God's commands are, are requirements given in the context of the covenant. And they're given in relationship to him with the promise of blessing, both physical and spiritual blessing, as well as temporal and eternal benefits. Living confidently in the covenant of God we'll call it a covenantal confidence, produces blessing. It produces the good that you and I are looking for every day. But conversely, to reject God's commands and his offer is to invite his curse upon you and your own destruction. So covenantal confidence begins, we'll see in chapter 3, with a basis, and then it proceeds to blessings. We're going to look first in the first four verses at the basis for a covenantal confidence. The scriptures, the scriptures do teach us to value relationships with older and wiser people. And it's not simply in biological terms in the nuclear family, but it's also to be seen in the context of other spheres, such as society and in the church. And so we have the blessing that God has provided in looking to those who can give wisdom. And we have the blessing of a multi-generational church right here. And what a joy to be able to experience that blessing of wisdom from those who are older and wiser, who have gone the course, who have walked the path farther than we have. That's a great blessing. So you see in the, the very first verse, the address, my son. My son. We've seen that address in chapters one and two, and we previously talked about how that's not, that's not singularly for males, but my son, as in speaking, a parent speaking to a child, one who is older and wiser speaking to one who is younger and simple and needs the wisdom of God. 
So my son, this is a father talking to a son, a mother talking to a daughter. In these first four verses, we'll see two proofs of the covenant of God, two proofs. First, we see a connection between God's commands and God's blessing, a connection between his commands and his blessing. And then secondly, we'll see the key phrase, the ESV renders it in verse three, steadfast love and faithfulness. Whatever your translation says, that phrase is key and connects us to the covenant. We'll look more closely at that in a few minutes. But the first thing I want you to see is what God has to offer. Now, if I'm, if I'm going shopping, generally I'm trading off of two attributes. There's quality and there's quantity. And if I want a lot of something, I generally aren't going to be getting the highest of quality, generally speaking, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to afford it. Otherwise, if I'm looking for something of great quality, I'm not looking for a whole lot of it, generally speaking. Think of an engagement ring. Think of that, that ring. You, generally speaking, you don't want to have to buy more than one engagement ring over the course of life. You want to buy that one ring, and that's the one. That is the one because that is the one person to whom the Lord has connected you to and will give you life. So quality and quantity, we, we generally trade those two off. But look at what the Lord does in verses one and two. The Lord offers quality and quantity. Verse two, for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. You see first the days and the years that will be added. These are units of measure. Length of days, years of life. Units of measure. Now, physical versus metaphorical versus spiritual, we can look at, look at those and compare them. But think of it in terms of whether I live on earth days or many years, even a hundred years. In light of eternity, it's just a vapor. It's just like a puff of wind. It's here and it's gone. So don't measure your life based on the number of days or years that you have on this earth. Recognize that in Christ, in the covenant with God, you have an eternity with him. You have all of that time. So you have quantity. You don't have to worry about that. But how we spend that quantity is going to be dependent upon how we are in relationship with the living God. And you'll see that in verse 2. Look at the word peace. For length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. So not forgetting the teaching, keeping the commandments will add days, years, and peace. Now, most of you know the Hebrew for the word peace is shalom. Shalom is not simply an absence of conflict an absence of warfare, although it is that. It is a wholeness, it is a completeness, it is an integrity, it is having everything that one needs. When I am at peace with God, I have everything that I need, no matter what is happening around me. That is a, a huge quality. So God offers length, life, and peace. He gives quality and quantity. Verse, uh, verses one and two should also sound familiar because there's an echo in it of one of the 10 commandments. So we know that God has given the commandments to Moses in Exodus chapter 20, and he begins with the first table, which defines our, our relationship to the living God. And then the second table of the commandments is relationships one to another, person to person. And the very first of those commandments is honor your father and your mother. Why? That your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses' extended sermon to prepare the people to enter the promised land, he gives a little more insight into that command. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord has commanded you. In other words, remember... And then he goes on to say that your days may be long and that it may go well with you. That it may go well with you. 
And then in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul gives us a little more clarity. And he points out that this is the first commandment with a promise. The first commandment with a promise. The promise of blessing. Proverbs is found among the wisdom literature of the Bible, we know. And the word wisdom is found 46 times in the ESV translation, uh, which is almost as many times as you find it in the New Testament. So we find wisdom for living life, for honoring God and finding joy and peace and length of days right here in Proverbs. As I said, Deuteronomy is Moses' extended sermon as he is preaching to the people of God to prepare them to enter into the promised land. And comparing a 30-minute sermon to the whole of Deuteronomy, right, we, we don't spend as much time as some sermons do. But with the time that the Lord has given us, well, we want it to be profitable. So Moses' sermon begins with the, with the introduction to remember the Lord God. He sets the history of the covenant. And then he gives the commands, the stipulations of the covenant. And then he expresses the blessings of keeping God's commands as well as the curse of rejecting his commands. It shows us the covenant. Covenant can be defined as a relationship that God establishes. He establishes with people and he guarantees it by his word. His word is the guarantee. The second proof of the covenant we see in verse 3 that it's reflected in here. Verse 3 says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, you see, as you compare, as I said, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. As you compare other translations, you'll see a variety of renderings for steadfast love. Uh, you'll see kindness. You'll see just love. You'll see mercy. And you have this sense of, is it they can't make up their mind? Or what, what is the point? Why are there so many different renderings, English renderings of that Hebrew word? Well, it's because of the complexity of that Hebrew word, Amen. which is chesed. It is God's covenant, faithful commitment, his loyalty to his people. His, and it is on the basis of faithfulness, his, which is the truth. God loves and love rejoices in the truth. And so his commitment to us is based on the truth, but it's committed upon, it, it's based upon his covenant character. So there's a simple Hebrew word for love, but this is not it. That's a different word. And so that's why the, the depth of the word is expressed through a number of different English translations. This is God's firm, stable, faithful commitment. It's the love of one who is in covenant, who is committed to the good of another, to that person's well-being based on the, the truth of God's word. So the first time we see that phrase, steadfast love and faithfulness, is found in Genesis chapter 24. And Abraham had sent his servant to find a wife for his son Isaac. And he'd given him instructions. And how was he going to find this woman? And the servant is obviously going forward in obedience, but moving in a sense of fear and trepidation of what, is this, what if this doesn't turn out right? What if I pick the wrong one? And so the servant's very careful to follow Abraham's instructions. And what happens? He finds the one. He finds the woman, Rebecca, who will be wed to Isaac. And the covenant relationship continues through the generations. But what does the servant say? Abraham's servant says this, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness. In other words, God has proven himself faithful. He's seen it through the commitment that he's made. And this provision of a spouse for Rebekah is one more way in which God shows himself faithful to the covenant. 
right? Because we know Abram was called in, in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham's called to deny himself and follow the Lord, to go out of his land, and God promises to make him a great nation. And then in chapter 15, God enacts the covenant with him, with Abram, and, the, and it continues. Now, all of this would be, would be futile if I just told you, all right, well, just, just follow the covenant. Just do it as well as you can. Just keep trying. Don't give up. See, we, as the people of God, depend upon a single covenant, a single covenant that was enacted from all eternity. This is the covenant that theologians call the covenant of redemption or the covenant of peace. This is a covenant that's enacted within the triune God between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This covenant of redemption is the only way that anyone could be saved. And it depends upon the one who fulfilled it in his blood and his righteousness, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who has enacted, who has fulfilled this covenant that was planned from all eternity. And it demonstrates God's covenant mercy. In fact, even in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ came in the fullness of grace and truth. The fullness of grace and truth. And theologians recognize that grace and truth is a, is a parallel. It's a synonym for God's steadfast love and his faithfulness. So Christ has fulfilled that covenant. And it is by faith in him and him alone that you enter into relationship with the living God. So verses one and three tell you what you must do. Do not forget, let your heart keep. Do not forget the commandments of God, let your heart keep his teaching, his commandments. That should sound a little bit like Bible memory, but it's so much more than memorizing a scripture. Bible memory is a part of it. In order to bind these commandments and to keep them, to not forget them, but to keep them, I need to grab hold of them. I need to make them mine. I need to own them in a sense so that they own me, so that I can respond. So it is important to see that. The blessing that we see from, from doing these things we see in the very life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because at the end of Luke chapter 2, we see uh, an echo of Proverbs 3, verse 4. Just as the Father tells the Son, do these things, you'll find favor and good success in the sight of God and the sight of man, we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, as Jesus demonstrated obedience to his father and mother, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with man. So the, the blessing that we have in, by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obeying his commands, we get to be more like Jesus, more and more conformed to the image of God's son. So there's a connection between godly authority uh, obedience to godly authority and blessing. The second theme that we see in Proverbs chapter 3, we'll look at in, in verses 5 through 12. The second theme is that covenant blessings flow from obedience, flow from that covenant relationship that God has established. And we'll see that in, in three commands. Trust in the Lord, honor the Lord, and do not despise the Lord's discipline. So verse five, trust in the Lord, and what's the benefit? What's the blessing? He will make your paths straight. Verse nine, honor the Lord. What's the blessing? Then your barns will be filled. Your vats will be bursting. And then lastly, in verse 11, do not despise the Lord's discipline. In other words, delight in it. Expect it, look forward to it. Why? Because it's the proof of his love. God's reproof is his proof that he loves you. Verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your heart. 
Jesus himself said that the mouth speaks out of what fills the heart. So the heart is the center of the thing. It's the most important thing. It's where we need to look. We don't want to fix behavior. We don't want to change behavior without starting with the heart. The behavior will lead to the heart. In fact, my behavior flows out of what's in my heart. And so it's important to understand the heart. The human being is made up of body and soul. Body and soul. And that soul, we can roughly understand it as three parts. They're integrated parts, but think of it as, as a mind, as desires, and as will. My mind is what I know. My desires reveal what I love, what I'm attracted to, and my will is the direction, the choice that I make, the way that I choose. But as a result of sin, what I know is incomplete. What I know is mixed, is, is error mixed with truth. What I know is not the fullness of what God has for me to know. My desires are twisted. They're sinful. They're, I'm attracted to things that I shouldn't be attracted to that are contrary to the word of God. And then my will is bent on pleasing myself. So the mind, the desires, and the will need a savior. They need to be redeemed. And Christ has fulfilled the offices of prophet, priest, and king so that these faculties can be renewed. I need a prophet who will teach me and assure me of what is true. God's word is truth so that I could think rightly, so that my mind could be renewed. I need a priest who will redeem and renew my love so that my loves are pure, so that they are pleasing to the Lord God. And I need a king who will subdue my will and then strengthen it to do the things that he's commanded me to do. I need the Lord Jesus Christ to be my prophet, priest, and king on a daily basis. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 says, gives us this promise. Um, and this, this was actually integrated into the confession of sin that, that we, we, we spoke of a little earlier today. We prayed. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is what we need. We cannot do this in and of our own strength. The person who has believed and received this promise lives a life now of trusting in the Lord, learning to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Indeed, trust is not a nice, slippery path into glory. Trust is actually a form of warfare. To trust in the Lord is to war against the very kingdom of darkness. It is the war against the course that this world is running to trust in the Lord is actually to go to war over the desires of my own heart, my sinful nature. Right? But I get to do battle with the spiritual armor that the Lord God has given. And in that armor and in prayer, I fight a daily battle of learning what it looks like, learning what it is to trust in the Lord with all my heart. What, what does trusting in the Lord look like? Well, verse 9 gives us an example. If I'm trusting in the Lord, I will also honor the Lord with my wealth, with the first fruits of my produce. You might think, well, wealth, that sounds like someone who's rich, and so that doesn't apply to me, so I don't need to honor the Lord with my wealth because I don't have any wealth yet. So I'll wait until I get a lot of wealth and then I'll honor the Lord, All right? But we know that's a fool's errand because Jesus himself rebuked the man who built barns and put everything in storage. And he said, you fool, because he was the one who was laying up treasure for himself rather than being rich 
toward God. So to trust in the Lord is to honor him with your wealth. What wealth do you have? Whatever he's given you, whatever he's given you is of wealth, is of value. You can honor him so that your barns will be filled. It seems counterintuitive. I'm going to honor the Lord with my wealth, and then my barns are going to be filled? Yes, that's what he's saying. And your vats will be bursting with wine. Another example of trusting in the Lord we see in verse 11. To trust in the Lord is to delight in his discipline. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Why does it say not be weary? Because we will, in our sinful fallen nature, grow weary of the Lord's reproof. We'll grow weary of that discipline. But the good news is God disciplines us for our benefit, for our good and for his glory. He disciplines us so that we may share in his holiness, Hebrews 12, verse 10. And we receive this blessing by trusting in the Lord with all our heart. You see, the writer of Hebrews had much to say about a son, God's eternally begotten son. Hebrews 1, verse 1, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And although he was a son, Hebrews tells us, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. You too will learn obedience from the things that you suffer. And lastly, the writer of Hebrews tells us to pay attention. If we neglect so great a salvation, what hope is there for us? But if we turn to the living God, as we see the covenant that he's provided for us, we have all the hope in the world. And that hope spills out to the saving of the nations. So please pray with me. Our God and Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is truth. Please sanctify us in this truth. Be glorified, Lord, in the lives of those here. And let us see that glory, Father, to the end of the world and to the end of the age, Father. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn now to...